Uh, there have been references to other questions I had, so I will skip those. Uh, most of these ships come in during the summer. Uh, there's a good bunch now, and and we also have the mineral activity. At least they have uh, a focus. Um, but even with some objections from the hunters. But now the, the tourist groups, uh, they are becoming a nuisance, uh, including the small craft um, with masts and so on, and they're getting into the inlets and so on. Uh, and then the biggest ones, uh, they had a great big cruise line, I believe was the largest uh, of these uh, cruise lines, possibly over a thousand passengers also came by. And we also have people um, assessing the population estimates of the Norwells, which way they're migrating and so on. <coughs> Near Pod Inlet, we have a, a observation point where on how the pods are being affected by the shipping traffic, even with um, the ships coming to the mine and so on, they do harass the narwhals, but then you get these cruise lines, they actually chase these pods of narwhals, and it becomes a possible danger point for the individuals, uh, the hunters, and the tourists. And at our annual general meeting, there was a request from the membership to decrease the number uh, of these tourists, of the tourist traffic because some of these, uh, because they're not used to the cruise ships, and sometimes even the uh, harvesters, the hunters, are being harassed by these tourists. And so I'm asking if there is any way that the number of these tourists could be lowered in terms of number and the sheer traffic uh, in our waters. And there's also reference to polluting the waters. Um, I'm pretty sure that there is some dumping now in our waters near Pond Inlet. We are seeing a lot more garbage in our waters. We did address it locally and how we can clean our oceans. And also there are some species now, even um, the fish, the red ones you could see in the water, um, in our oceans, they're not seen anymore. And the other ones too uh, are the little um, devil ray shaped fish that are centimeters long, so we don't see those species now either. Um, could it be because of the dumping in our waters? We do have researchers studying the ice and conditions in the ice, the climate fluctuations, uh, pollution in the snow, and on how it is affecting the ice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, the high traffic of cruise ships is a big concern. I know it's an income for a lot of people. In regards to the, the big cruise ships, um, thank you for your questions, Elijah. Um, they they were in contact with the the proper authorities like a year and a half, two years before they came, and they met all the regulations they were required to meet. 
but there have been many concerns expressed by Inuit and uh, right now at NTI <clears throat> they're looking at some of the options and issues they can do in regards to developing tourism standards and uh, whenever there's issues if you see about these people chasing animals and interfering with wildlife please make sure your wildlife officer knows and maybe even call NTI about it. Um, as for the little fish, uh, I think it's hard to say why they're gone. We, we don't know if it's from the dumping or from pollution, but as the ocean warms up and species move around, there could be more coming and eating them or pushing them out of their habitat. Uh, in the Arctic, our species are very specialized as to where they live and what kind of conditions they have. So it could be that as well. But uh, if, if there's more questions, I would really recommend uh, talking to a wildlife officer about it and moving that up uh, as an issue. And, um, but if you have questions about marine issues and tourism issues for, for Inuit, um, we have people at NTI that work on that that would be happy to help you with some of those answers. Maybe it's not a question that as we are preparing a plan, planning according to Indian traditional knowledge, and I don't want to just hear uh, comments, but I'd like to see or hear strong commitment that we can push all the governments by NTI and and by the people here, uh, even when they assure us that they will be planning, nothing is done. Uh, the oldest member of the legislature, Isaac Suyo, he seems to get very small support for what he stands for, that a lot of the M MLAs maybe don't understand his position. And I'd like to see a strong, stern commitment that they will be planning for climate change based on Inuit Kaujumayi Because uh, when we got the information, it felt, it, I got the impression that we were going to be, as elders, important to this climate change uh, conference. And so I know some of you are only bureaucrats and so on, you have your superiors and so on. I know you will need to seek their commitment as well. And I'd like to know too if the federal government has committed as well. Thank you. First perspective, maybe I'm um, sorry about that. Um, so our program has always uh, been uh, funding projects by the community for the communities. Uh, traditional knowledge has always been at the front, front and center of everything we were funding within the communities. Uh, and we want to bring those principles that we've used on a project base, basis uh, for many years into a broader level uh, pan-northern adaptation strategy. Um, so it is principles that uh, our departments have been using over the years and we want to make sure that we'll, we'll be uh, put the, putting them uh, at the heart of the Northern Adaptation Strategy. Okay. Um, and I'll also add um, that the government of Nunavut, um, particularly when it comes to climate change, um, ha is committed and has committed um, to incorporating incorporating uh, into our decision making um, across the board, whether it's our policies or our programs, um, it's a really important aspect, particularly to climate change, because um, as we know and as we see, there's a lot of um, Western science data gaps um, in our knowledge around climate change. There isn't, you know, we've only had some. 40, 50 years of researchers, you know, really coming up and um, doing what we call baseline studies 
Whereas Inuit Chayimayat Khangi gives us generations and generations of knowledge to draw on, um, whether it's related to wildlife or the weather. And so we actually um, uh, really rely on, on your knowledge, on our community's knowledge, on our on Inuit Chayimayat Khangi to understand what's even happening so that way we can plan for it. Um, we've talked about permafrost a few times today and permafrost is a perfect example. We really don't have a lot of science um, to show, you know, what did permafrost look like, you know, 40, 50 years ago. We weren't doing a lot of studies. We can study glaciers and take ice cores, but um, we really rely on, on local and um, traditional knowledge to inform us of what's happened and what is happening. Um, so it's definitely um, a very important thing to us and, uh, and so it's meetings like this that we, we hope to see more of. It's engagement with community members and elders that we really hope to continue to do. Um, and we're, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of activity nationally and internationally on climate change. Um, but in Nunavut, there's, there's also a lot of momentum happening. So we're very much trying to stay on top of everything that's going on in communities, in the research world, and find ways of taking it all and sharing it, um, but also learning from others. So um, again, I think tomorrow is going to be a great day where we can talk a bit more about how we can all take, you know, to have different responsibilities in it, but what we can all do together to make sure that, you know, that you, communities are feeling heard and that government is being informed and that we have pathways to do that and maybe finding ways to improve that, those communication mechanisms so that policies and programs that come out, you know, next year or in the next 10, 20 years, whether they're in the government of Nunavut or in the federal government, that they're truly reflective of Nunavut needs and values. So, Thank you for your comments and questions. Um, I can assure you that NTI is very committed to ensuring that IQ principles and Inuit uh, common practices from the history are here and they're informing the new policies moving forward. Uh, for too long, we've been seeing top-down approaches that, that try to fit us into their programs. So that's why we're here today, uh, to, to learn from our history, to learn from our past, and to use those same principles to build new answers, to look at solutions now, instead of looking at more and more problems, instead of just looking at what's changing. I mean, what can we do about it, and how can we do it to help Inuit that is supported by Inuit and they feel engaged and a part of the solution. Um, this is, was not a very easy workshop to organize and it uh, took a lot of planning and partners and from, from just this workshop alone, uh, we've built some strong relationships between the federal, territorial and Inuit about moving forward. And uh, I'd, I'd like to assure you that we, we, we would really like to see all policies moving forward that are reflective of Inuit values. Hello, I'm Sakiasi Saurlapik from Arctic Bay. I have a, a concern because it's being raised more often and I don't know if um, if it's really happening, but with regard to the climate changing and people say that weather is warming, I believe that is the case. I, I, I find that the condition of the ice is uh, changing where it tends to break up quick, quicker. I find that the war warming of the oceans is also happening. And when we think about uh, uh, the polar bears, and people have been concerned worldwide about uh, perhaps they might become extinct because uh, people are concerned that they're, they have lived off the ice for so long, and that's been a concern. Even though that is the case, 
and there's an increase in population, even though we have no more dogs, uh, society as a whole. And that is something that is of a concern uh, about the increasing population of the polar bears. And they are um, coming in land more where there's populated areas. And I could say that uh, during the, the early summer, and when there are eggs uh, of the shoreline birds, I found that the high Arctic, there's no Canada geese, for example. There's different types that are not uh, in, you know, they don't, uh, we don't have those types of shorebirds and other uh, birds in our areas. I'm finding, though, that some species um, are, there used to be a scarce of here and there of um, Canada geese, but we're finding that they are coming out in increasing population. So we, we're finding this quite a change. And this is happening now. And Arctic swan, these are becoming more apparent and seen. And we are seeing changes in the uh, population of some species, whether they're increasing or whether they're disappearing. So we're finding these are changes that are happening. I don't know if um, there are harmful effects to the cycle of um, of the the food chain or the wildlife or it's uh, the land. And there's also this, the fish species. There's an area where there was never really any fish. And I found, though, in some locations you can catch fish, and the fish are quite large. And I'm finding, though, that fish seems to be coming out now in numbers where we haven't normally found fish species in the, in the lakes and in some rivers. I'm wondering if it's a, as a result of the changing climate. I'm not sure. Perhaps. I'm just wondering if uh, these are things that you might have thought about and the types of species that people have been noticing. Um, this is just uh, an idea for you to think about, but I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about these things I raised. Thank you. Thank you, Sakyasi. Uh, we, we hear these concerns all over Nunavut, new species, uh, more of them, less of them, um, different health conditions of the animals, and, um, and they're looking into it. There's also many more insects coming, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Arctic species that live here for, for so long are, are specialized, and these are the conditions they like. So as they warm and change, they often go further north or to other areas where, where it's more to their liking. But it also opens up the area to other species that are coming in and eating them or eating other things that may have ate them. So then you can see population increases. Um, so People are very much looking at a lot of wildlife research right now, and even insects and plants, and trying to find out what that's doing to the food systems and the food webs. And, uh, but a lot of those research programs take 15, 20 years before they get enough information to say it wasn't just a one-time thing, that, that it's a power series in, uh, in evidence. Um, but we're hearing it more and more, and in, in the bears issue especially, and, uh, but policies right there, and he'll be able to give you some more information about what's happening with polar bear research and con concerns. And uh, I think that's all I can answer for now. 
I had a question to Minister Savikata with regard to the foods because um, you need to eat all types of foods and I'm quite happy that there's a, a, a representative here from the health department at the federal level. So I'd like to re-ask the question and I met with my fellow women in Pannatuk um, and it was raised that um, the question was asked basically if we're getting sick with cancer because of our food chain and perhaps our foods are contaminated and Luti was raising the question about cancer and diabetes and so even uh, allergies or skin irritations perhaps that were non-existent are more prevalent now. They're prevalent in the population and there's an increasing number with these problems. I could say close to Pannartu and people caught clams and brought them back home, but uh, quite a number of people in one day had to go to the health center because um, they had developed an allergy and they had to be um, given medication because they had breathing problems even. And the research that is um, here, there's of course research always taking place, but Nunavut uh, Tungavik and Nunavut government and the health department within Canada. I'm wondering if uh, you had met at all to discuss these specific concerns that I, I'm raising. Um, these are concerns that we have in our community. I'm quite pleased today to have mentioned it to Mr. Savikata. He didn't seem to really answer my question. So I wanted to raise it again uh, to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Well, first, thank you very much for the question. Um, in terms of uh, the, the different impact of the food chain on the, the, the health of the people, uh, in terms of the research, this is not something that I can talk about because it's, it's outside of the scope of the funding that I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for. However, I know that in the past, some of the projects that were funded was to deal with um, um, uh, hunting skills and how to prep to prep the food to make sure that it's it's healthy. Um, so so that the, the, for example, if there's parts of the animals that can't be eaten anymore, like we're going to disseminate some information about that and how to to uh, to uh, prep the animal for for consumption afterwards. Um, in, in terms of the science, some some of the science have been done in terms of levels of of um, different um, polluants that are uh, uh, that we can found in the animals uh, uh, um, those levels like are can, can be assessed and I think the minister talked about the bringing uh, some of the catch that you have to to some of the wildlife um, uh, office for for assessment so all of that has been done in terms of um, more discussion and um, uh, around the work to be done between the, the government of Nunavut, NTI, and health. We're more than happy to continue the, the collaboration that started recently, like for myself, because I'm new to the file, but with NTI and, and the government of Nunavut. And we also have a health table that's been existing for uh, several years now where we have discussion around that type of issues. Um, the fact that you raised the question today is really important because it's going to, like I mentioned before, it's going to be recorded and brought forward as something that's important and is a priority for, for the uh, uh, Inuit population here so that we can continue to have those discussions. So this is kind of what I, I can say uh, for now in terms of the, the work that we've done is around like the skills and try to uh, equip with people with what can be eaten and what cannot and how many fish of that type you can eat in a day and things like that. Um, and uh, 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 in terms of for future discussion, we're more than happy to continue to have the discussion with NTI and GN uh, on, on those type of uh, important research and, and information. Uh, 
Um, I'll speak up pretty quick. Thanks for the question, Nancy. Um, what I just I would say to reiterate is that um, the Climate Change Secretariat and the Department of Environment would be really happy to follow up on that and try and get you some more answers to your questions, um, and then also sh try and share that too more broadly. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll follow up with you, and my staff are writing down your your question at the back, and we'll get you some more information, and, and we'll work with NTI and Health Canada to see what we can get together. Thanks. Thanks for the questions, Nancy. Um, right now, GN, NTI, and the federal government sit together on a program called the Northern Contaminants Program. And every year, uh, or sometimes every three years, depending on the funding um, and the, the, the plan for research, but we look at all the different contaminant levels in animals and different types of food that Inuit eat to, to determine that they, they're safe to eat. Um, from and I sit on that management committee uh, if there was any food or animals that were above those levels public health would be issuing a public health uh, safety advisory and consumption guidelines uh, if you have any questions about what's safe to eat or not I would recommend speaking with your public health official and making sure that uh, if they don't have the answers that you keep bothering them uh, in regards to the clams um, and increased allergies, uh, I don't really have an answer for that, but the here in Iqaluit this past summer, they started looking at contaminants and different parasites in clams. And uh, I think they had a pretty good research season, but um, they, they may be looking to expand that program. Uh, and for the cancer questions, um, I, I wouldn't be able to say with any authority about why it's happening, but a lot of the literature shows that when, uh, when people dramatically shift their lifestyle and their diets and eat less um, nutritious foods and, and be less active, that they have a higher chance of being, uh, becoming sick. Whether that's cancer or not is something else, but uh, I'm pretty sure you're aware that Inuit have dramatically changed their diet in the last 40 years and not enough research has been done to look into that. Uh, for partnerships, again, uh, the GN, NTI, and McGill University right now are working together to try to get funding to develop a Nunavut-wide monitoring system based off of seasonal eating patterns so that we can get a true exposure assessment to look at all the different kinds of foods we eat. When you see these things like you can eat two or three fish a week or whatever down south they're talking about people that only eat it once or twice a week and in a specific small size like 250 grams like the size of your palm and and they assume that that's one serving and we all know that Inuit tend to eat until we feel good or full and it's not only a size of our hand and and it's not the only thing we're eating so what we're trying to do is build this new program that would be able to look at every community and determine on average what people are eating, including store-bought foods. Um, but that's, it's gonna be, uh, we won't know for a little while if we get the funding or not, but that's something we're really looking into and the GN Health Department and NTI are working together on that with McGill University. Um, but the, like I said, the, the allergies in that are, I, I'm hearing more of it and people are getting allergic to fish and to other things and um, we don't have answers for that yet. But in other populations around the world as well, people often uh, as they age or as their health changes are, are more susceptible to different parts of the food that cause different reactions. But uh, if you have more questions about contaminants or what you can eat or talk to public health or call us because we there's about we look at seals, walrus, uh, polar bears, caribou, fish, all that to make sure the contaminants are not high and safe enough to eat. And if there ever is findings that they are too high, there, there will be a public health advisory. 